Hi folks, it's Dr. P. In digital systems, we spend a lot of time talking about different types of devices that can be used to build circuits. Unfortunately, we don't have the time to use each type of logic device in lab. This means that you don't really get into the nuts and bolts of each type of logic device to see the pros and cons of each. I decided to build both a combinational logic project and a sequential logic project using different types of logic devices to compare each type of implementation. I should note that there are more ways to implement projects than just those I'm showing in this video. Notably missing from this video is Field Programmable Gate Arrays, or FPGAs. FPGAs are really robust, but are mostly just too much for small projects. FPGAs also require knowledge of a hardware description language. I like using FPGAs, but haven't found a low cost or low footprint way to use them yet. I have an FPGA, but to use this with a project would require me building a shield to place on top of the FPGA. This is my FPGA. This is the actual FPGA chip. Everything else is just an added on peripheral device to make this thing easier to use. For me to build something with this, I'd have to build a PCB that has headers that could just kind of snap in and sit on top of this device. The FPGAs themselves are generally surface mount, so they're not really accessible in a way that DIP architecture is for hobbyists. The first project that I made is the combinational logic project. What this does is it counts up how many ones there are on a DIP switch. Right now, all of my DIP switches are off, so there are zero ones. Each time I turn on one of the switches, my value is going to increment because it's counting up however many of these switches are on. When I start turning them off, it's going to decrement again. So what this is really doing is just adding up the number of ones present on the input and then displaying it on a seven segment display. I decided to build this with discrete logic chips, mostly adders in this case, with an EPROM and with a microcontroller. The whole idea is that each of these is identical if you only saw the dip switch in the display, you wouldn't be able to tell me how I built the project. Regardless of what type of technology you use to build a project, you should always know what the circuit should do before you build it. Start with a schematic, truth table, block diagram, or flowchart of some kind that you can use to build your project off of. Using discrete logic chips, I implemented the ones counter with a bunch of adder chips. These are the 74, 283, 4-bit adders. This also required a display, so I used a 7448 BCD to 7-segment display chip. I built it on a breadboard to test it before placing it onto this protoboard and soldering it. I thought this one was pretty fun because I tried to find ways to decrease the footprint as much as possible. I used the 7448 chip for decoding because the internal resistors on the chip means I don't have to use external current limiting resistors for the display. This is also probably the most accessible way to build this project for a digital system student. All you need are some components, a power supply or just a couple of batteries, and a breadboard. No advanced knowledge or specialized parts are needed. However, this is definitely the biggest project implementation as far as the footprint. It takes a lot of space to place all of those logic chips. It was also the most expensive on a per part basis at about $23.50. The EPROM is a very efficient but kind of boring solution. An EPROM is essentially a giant truth table programmed onto a chip. However, the nature of the EPROM means that I could not only do the addition of all of the input bits, but also do the seven segment decoding all on one chip. This means I didn't need an external BCD to seven segment decoder chip. What this chip is are a bunch of current limiting resistors to use with the display. I wrote a program in C to generate the hex file to program onto the EPROM. Otherwise, I would have needed to type in 256 different values into the programming software. That would have been pretty tedious. This implementation also requires a programmer. I additionally used an a UV EPROM first to prototype. So there's definitely a level of equipment that you need to have to make something like this work. A programmer can cost about $60 
and a UV eraser can cost another $20 to $30. However, once you have those, you can reuse them. Just looking at the parts I built on this board, it cost about $14.50 and has a pretty compact footprint, especially compared to the discrete digital logic components. Finally, I used an Atmega 328P microcontroller to build the ones adder. This is the same microcontroller used on the Arduino Uno. This requires an extra level of knowledge, the C programming language. Because I teach microcontrollers, I've learned a lot about writing microcontroller code over the past few years. Because a microcontroller is so powerful, I, did de I decided to put all my effort into making my code as efficient and compact as possible. You can't see that part, but it's kind of hidden inside this chip. Otherwise, this implementation would have been kind of boring. The nice thing about the Atmega 328P is that there are internal pull-up resistors available on the chip, so I didn't need to use any pull-down resistors on the dip switch. I could also do all of the seven-segment de display decoding on the microcontroller itself. This chip is just a bunch of current-limiting resistors that are used for the display. Another really nice thing about using a microcontroller is that if I had soldered this wrong, I could just reprogram the chip to fix things rather than have to desolder and resolder any incorrect connections. I did need to use the same programmer that I used on the EPROM to program this microcontroller chip. So a programmer is a really nice tool, but it's not free. Otherwise, this has a very nice small footprint and the parts cost just over $14 marginally cheaper than the EPROM. The sequential logic project counts up to 60 at a frequency of nominally one hertz. It's pretty clear how relevant this project would be in any kind of timer circuitry. I built it with discrete logic chips, with a PAL, and with a microcontroller. There were a lot of ways that I could have built a counter that counts from zero to 59 using discrete chips. I went with the 74190 BCD counter, using two of them. Building a ripple counter from scratch would have taken up an awful lot of space. However, I considered an awful lot of different chips to use, so it was kind of fun to look up what chips exist in the 7400 series and really thinking about how to make this as efficient as possible. The 74190 chip wasn't a, totally a piece of cake. I needed to figure out how to asynchronously clear everything once it reached 59. So a NAND chip is included on the board to do that. I also needed to use two BCD to seven segment decoder chips to display the output. I used the 7448 chips again because they have those internal resistors so that I can get that current limiting resistance without having to use external resistors. The one Hertz clock is implemented with a 555 timer. I tried to find a better way to do this, but wasn't thrilled with my options. This is definitely not a very accurate timer. It's not a huge deal counting up for one minute, but if I were to expand this to count hours, it probably wouldn't make a very good clock in general. Again, as far as a digital system student just deciding to build something for fun, this doesn't really require anything more than what you see here on the proto board. But all the parts aren't cheap. This came out to just under $30. The most expensive part is the protoboard itself, but each of these chips adds up. I know you can't really see the timer because of the amount of light in my house, so I'm going to block the light a little bit so you can see what the display looks like as it counts from 0 to 59. Once it gets to 59, it asynchronously clears everything and starts back up at 0 again. Programmable array logic, or PAL, is kind of like ancient technology at this point, but I found it really interesting to work with. The difficult part was finding free software that would work with a modern computer. Thankfully, Atmel's WinCupel can work on Windows, so I used that. There's a little bit of a learning curve involved here. I needed to really read and understand the data sheet of the PAL chips that I have. These aren't as simple to work with as EPROMs or microcontrollers, but they're a really interesting way to build a project. Basically, a PAL, and this right here is the PAL chip, has a bunch of programmable AND gates that are connected to OR gates, so you can use it to implement SOP expressions. Those outputs can be connected to a flip-flop to implement sequential logic if you want. 
However, there are a fixed number of output pins. This particular chip has 16 pins, and only eight of them can be used as outputs. Anything that's not used as an output can be used as an input. Furthermore, one of the pins needs to be used as a clock, and sometimes there's also an enable pin. So by the time you deal with that, you really only have about 14 pins to work with. So coming up with a minimum SOP implementation is crucial, as is understanding what the device is actually capable of doing. So this thing counts from 0 to 59, and again back to 0 again, using a synchronous counter that's programmed using WinQuple, basically just with minimum SOP expressions for each output. I still need a BCD to seven segment decoder for each one of these numbers to then put the value on the display. Finally, I needed a 555 timer as a clock. So again, not very accurate, but it works. The logic levels weren't very compatible between the 555 and the PAL. So I used a 7414 chip to get my clock to work consistently. This ended up having a larger footprint than I was hoping for but it was a really cool introduction to using PAL chips. I found it very rewarding. I needed to use that same programmer in order to program this chip. Thankfully, it's the same programmer I can use with the EPROM and the AVR microcontrollers. Otherwise, all of the parts here cost $27.50. Last, I used the Atmega 328P microcontroller. Again, because this is almost like using a race car to run a foot race, I decided to put the challenge into making the code as efficient as possible. I also decided to use a watch oscillator to make the clock as accurate to one hertz as possible. So that's what this external crystal here is all about. The microcontroller can not only count accurately using this external crystal, it can also decode the outputs. I also decided to multiplex the two digits, so I only have to use seven pins for the display rather than 14. Basically, the microcontroller writes one digit at a time, but cycles through them so quickly that you can't tell it's not writing everything all at once. The only hardware I needed other than the microcontroller, crystal, and display were current limiting resistors. Some of them are actually soldered on underneath the protoboard so that I could use the smallest protoboard size that I have. Again, this used my programmer, but otherwise the parts cost only just under $15. What I got from this project, and I hope that you get from this video, is that building a project with a few different types of technology is a really great way to get to know the pros and cons of each technology. I'm not gonna lie, most of my projects are built with an 8-bit AVR microcontroller. However, using a microcontroller can sometimes take the fun out of the design. All right, folks, hopefully this gave you a good appreciation for the different things we've learned about in digital systems. Maybe I've inspired you to try a similar project yourself. Until next time, stay well.